Okay, right, there. Ball is not spinning. All right, let's go ahead and cover a couple of more basic concepts in parasitology uh, before we start marching our way through the different groups of parasites. Uh, we talked on Friday about the difference between uh, predators and parasites, for example. Now, if you remember, predators tend to be bigger than their prey. They interact with their prey over a very short time. Uh, a predator will eat many prey and a predator will um, usually eat more than one species of prey and a predator will typically kill its prey if everything has gone according to plan. I mean, maybe the prey will get away, but from the predator's point of view, what it's trying to do is kill the prey. Parasites, remember, are different because parasites are smaller than their hosts. Parasites may interact with their host for a much longer portion of both of their lifespans. Each parasite will usually only infect one host in its life. Some parasites can infect multiple species, but many of them are very host specific. They'll only infect one species or maybe a cluster of related species. And then finally, parasites, from the parasite's point of view, they don't go out of their way to kill their hosts. It can happen, but if you think about it, it's not necessarily in the parasite's evolutionary best interest to kill its own host. Right? It's better for the parasite to let the host live and you know, you know, milk it for all it's worth, as it were. Um, and that's what selection will tend to favor, parasites that don't kill their hosts too quickly or overwhelm them. And we talked about some cases that are kind of in between, uh, like micro-predators, like mosquitoes, which in some ways are more on the predator side and in other ways are more on the uh, parasite side. Now let's look at a few more. Oh, hang on. And admit. Trying to get in. Okay, right. Looks like everybody in this room can see that slide, and I'm going to assume, hopefully, that everybody in uh, Internet land can see it, too. Uh, if you can't, briefly unmute and say, Dr. Wagner, we can't see the slide, and I'll probably start screaming uncontrollably. Okay, seems to be good. So, parasites are symbionts. They form long-term relationships with their hosts. They harm the host and benefit themselves, but they don't necessarily kill their hosts. Now, viruses and pathogenic bacteria certainly fit the definition of parasites. They're usually not studied in parasitology classes, and I'm not entirely sure there's a really good reason for that. Uh, why it is that if you want to study parasitic bacteria, you have to go take pathophysiology or clinical micro or something like that. Um, I'm not 100% sure there's a difference other than ancient turf wars. Uh, many fungi are, of course, parasitic. Uh, athlete's foot is one that you might know. Uh, there's lots of fungi that are parasitic on plants. Uh, there are some plants that are parasitic. Uh, dodder is one that you can see around here. Uh, even a wildflower called Indian paintbrush, genus Castilea, is quite beautiful and it's a root parasite on other plants. We're not going to talk much about them just because this is animal parasitology and we're just about exclusively going to talk about protists and animals being parasitic on animals, just because we have to draw the line somewhere. Organisms build up four different types of what you can think of as wealth resources over their lifespans. There's the matter that they're physically made of, uh, their biomass. There's the chemical reactions that they can carry out, 
their metabolism. Uh, by metabolism, they might make, let's say, compounds that take up very little biomass, uh, but nonetheless are critically important. Uh, hormones, for example, are a minuscule fraction of your biomass, and yet they are critical parts of your metabolism. You have to make them uh, in order to maintain your physiology. Uh, the behaviors that organisms engage in, we can call their work, and then their products would be things that they make. Uh, everything from bird nests to beehives uh, to uh, little caddisfly tubes, all of those things. Richard Dawkins, uh, you might know best as a popularizer of evolution and a uh, writer of some rather peppery atheist books, uh, but he wrote an earlier book called The Extended Phenotype. And the extended phenotype is basically the sum of all of those resources. It's all of the things that an organism's genes ultimately cause it to make and do. Uh, you build up your biomass, you metabolize chemicals in various pathways, you engage in behaviors, and you build things ultimately because your genes are, I hesitate to say that they're making you do it because they're not, you know, pulling your strings, you know. You, you don't go build a house because you were genetically predisposed to build a split level ranch house on a uh, oversized suburban lot or anything like that. Uh, but they do ultimately make it possible at some level for you to do all these things. When we're talking about predation, sorry, that's not. The predator is usually interested primarily in the first of these factors. Uh, so here is a shark uh, that is about to take all of the biomass of a very unfortunate seal and incorporate it into its own biomass thereby transporting biomass up a trophic level. Okay, big part, somebody just rang in. One moment. Okay, right, hi there, back to the slides. There. Okay, so when we're talking about predators, the predator usually is only taking the biomass. Uh, so yes, there is a shark taking all of the biomass of a very unfortunate seal. Here's a parasite. Uh, this is, we'll talk about this one in detail later. Uh, because it's a severe public health problem in some parts of the world. This is schistosoma, uh, the human blood fluke. Uh, it's a uh, parasitic worm uh, that lives inside major blood vessels and uh, feeds on blood. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a male. Uh, there's a little groove on the male's underbelly. Uh, where the female would uh, would fit in. These actually pair up in pairs and crank out lots of eggs and live their lives in a perpetual spoon. And parasites and other symbionts can take advantage of all four of these factors. Uh, so schistosomes take biomass because they swallow your blood if you have them. They're also dependent on your metabolism. They don't take just, you know, source of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, they've lost the ability to synthesize the DNA bases adenine and guanine. Uh, they can no longer synthesize purines. They are, however, very efficient at extracting purines from their environment. So they're not just dependent on the host is a source of food. They're dependent on some very specific uh, metabolic chemistry that the host can carry out that they can't.
Uh, schistosomes, incidentally, have also lost the ability uh, to make sterols, you know, cholesterol, and things like that, uh, which you need not just as hormones, but for things like regulating cell membrane fluidity. Uh, they also can't make fatty acids. And I just found out that they've also lost the ability to oxidize fatty acids. They can't burn them. Uh, they can't put fatty acids into uh, the Krebs cycle uh, to generate ATP. Uh, they've gotten very good at taking up these products from their host. Uh, so they use um, host, not I'm, I'm here for not getting updated slides right now. Well, uh, we're still looking at the chart. Uh, say again. Uh, right now online, we are still looking at the shark slide from uh, two pages ago. Oh, God. Right. Okay. What are you seeing now? Uh, nothing, no. Okay. All right. Um, window. Okay, what do you see now? Now we can see the schistosome slide. Okay, you're seeing the schistosomes, you can't make sterols or fatty acids. Okay, are you seeing that still? Yes. Okay, great. All right, are you now seeing a uh, big cuckoo chick? Uh, we're seeing nothing. Suka bit. Any of you guys speak Russian? I'm familiar with that. Oh dang! There, there goes my there goes my best one. <laughs> okay, why is it not advancing? It was working before, right? Was it? It was working previously. So you saw everything up to the shark eating the seal. Internet people? Uh, we, we jumped directly to the shark eating the seal, oh. and then it stayed there until I said something. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. All right, are you seeing anything, internet people? No. Okay, now you're seeing nothing? Correct. Okay. Okay, present. Window. Okay, so you're seeing the schistosomes? Yes. Okay. Okay. Why is this? Okay, now you're not seeing anything. Correct. Window. Ooh, that's new. What now we that? actually have a full screen of the break it down slide. A full screen of the break it down slide. Okay. 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 Are you seeing oh. the shark now? now it works. Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay. I don't know what the leap I just did, and I hope I figure <laughs> it out so I don't have to go through this crap every time we do a presentation because that's going to get old. But thank you for talking me through it. Okay. Right. Okay, so histosomes can't make their own purines and they can't make their own fatty acids. So they are parasites on your metabolism as well as on just your biomass. Um, you also have parasites that parasitize not so much biomass or metabolism as work and products. Uh, so here's a cuckoo chick 
uh, being fed by uh, mommy bird. And I assume you know this, that cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests and uh, the cuckoo chick is larger and it crowds out the bird's actual offspring and gets mommy to feed it and not its own offspring. Uh, so the cuckoo is parasitizing not the host's biomass, the host isn't eating the cuckoo, or the cuckoo's not eating the host, but it's a parasite on the host's feeding behavior and on the host products, the nest that it makes. Okay, another fun example. Um, the East African Rift Valley lakes in Africa are famous for a huge diversity of fish in a family called the cichlidae. Uh, if any of you uh, are fans of saltwater aquariums, uh, you might have seen or maybe even kept uh, East African cichlids. Uh, just about any pet store with a decent aquarium department will stock some. You can see cichlids on any given day at uh, PetSmart or um, uh, probably Petco, uh, certainly at, at Pet Country. Um, they're quite popular and very attractive fish, many of them are. And some cichlids are mouth brooders, uh, which means that mommy lays eggs and then one of the parents, sometimes mom and sometimes dad, uh, pick up their own eggs and hold them in their mouths and keep them there until they hatch and then retain the larvae uh, in their mouths until the larvae are large enough that they can leave and survive independently. Uh, so here's some larvae that are out for a stroll, uh, but they will dash right back into mommy's mouth uh, if, uh, if danger threatens. Uh, some of these cichlid parents may not eat for a month or more because, you know, they can't eat their own eggs or, or babies. Here's a parasite for you. This is a catfish called Cynodontus. And what it will do is swoop down and lay its own eggs right in the middle of a cichlid's eggs just as the cichlid is picking them up. So Cynodontus will try to lay its eggs in the middle of a cichlid's clutch of eggs. Uh, the Cynodontus eggs end up getting taken care of by the cichlid. Uh, the Cynodontus, incidentally, will try to eat the cichlid's own eggs while it's laying its eggs in the middle of the cichlid eggs. So Cynodontus is a predator on the cichlid eggs. It's also a brood parasite like the cuckoo is. It's a parasite on the cichlids work. Okay, why not? And now, we've lost the ability to advance slides. Okay, internet people, please tell me you saw that slide change. It did. Okay, all right. Once they're in the mouth, the Cynodontus eggs hatch faster, um, and the Cynodontus babies will start eating their host eggs and host young uh, while they're taking advantage of uh, the cichlid parent's protection. So again, you've got the adult Cynodontus is a predator because it eats uh, cichlid eggs. The baby Cynodontus is a predator because it eats the host eggs and larvae, and it's also at the same time a parasite on the host's own behavior. So these kinds of host parasite relationships can get pretty subtle, and it's kind of neat to find an organism that is a parasite and a predator 
all the same species at the same time in different ways. Just a few more terms for relationships among species. Uh, this rather phallic thing that you see is a pretty common marine invertebrate uh, called an innkeeper worm, uh, Eurekis calpo. It uh, used to be in its own phylum, but we now know it's a highly modified segmented worm. This thing is kin to uh, earthworms. Um, even though the body's not segmented, uh, it lives in, it's marine, it lives on sandy and muddy beaches, and it builds tube-shaped burrows, uh, shaped like the letter U. And uh, here you're seeing a cross-section uh, through one of these burrows, um, where it's able to very slowly pump water through the burrow and filter out uh, food particles that pass through. Uh, the burrows are more or less permanent, and the burrows become host to, uh, there's a couple of species of very small crab uh, that live almost nowhere else but in the burrow. Uh, there are other worms that like living in uh, Eurekis burrows. Uh, there's even little gobies. Uh, there's a species of small fish uh, that likes living in these burrows. They don't seem to harm uh, the worm in any way that I've ever heard. Uh, they're just using the structure that the worm builds, uh, but not really damaging the worm itself. That kind of relationship is called inquilinism. If you're living in a structure uh, that your host build, built, but it's not parasitic because you're not really harming the host. So inquilinism would be a form of commensalism, uh, not parasitism. And this, by the way, is why Eurekis calpo is affectionately known as the innkeeper worm, uh, because that burrow can be host uh, to a pretty sizable community of uh, guests, as it were. There's a second type of symbiosis called foracy. And in foracy, the symbiont gets transportation so the symbiont is benefiting, um, I guess, from the host's work in this case, uh, instead of the host's you know, products. Um, but foracy is commensal. Uh, the host is not uh, damaging, sorry, the, the symbiont is not damaging the host in any particular way. Uh, this is a well-known example uh, there's a shark with a remora uh, on it. Uh, remoras are fish with flat heads, and um, the, uh, I think it's actually the front of the dorsal fin is actually modified into a kind of suction cup. Uh, so remoras can stick their heads onto a shark, a whale, a sea turtle, uh, a human diver, and uh, hitch a ride. And then when the shark feeds, the remoras uh, on the shark will drop off and grab any little tidbits that the shark lets float away. Uh, if memory serves, uh, remoras will also scavenge when the shark defecates. So yeah, be glad you're not a remora. This would be foracy because the remoras uh, don't particularly harm the shark. I guess they might if the shark was so covered with remoras that it could no longer swim efficiently. Um, I don't know if that ever happens. I suspect it doesn't. Uh, but one remora does not do significant damage to the shark. Uh, the sucking disc does not damage the, the skin or anything like that. So we call this a foretic relationship, uh, biological hitchhiking. Here's another awesome case where you can have more than one type. Uh, this is the human bot fly, uh, Dermatobia hominis. Bot flies, a bot fly is a type of fly um, where the maggots live under the skin of a mammalian host. Uh, there are uh, cow bot flies, um, 
Those of you in this room, anybody interested in veterinary medicine? Okay, internet people, I don't know if you are, but there's usually several people in parasitology class who want to be vets. Um, one of the fun things that you sometimes deal with if you're working with, uh, uh, working with cattle is uh, that they can get flies that will lay eggs under the cow's skin and uh, the maggots develop uh, under the cow's skin until they finally emerge. And it's a very unpleasant uh, experience for the cow, or it certainly looks like it. Humans get these as well. Uh, this is Dermatobia hominis. And the adult flies lay their eggs on another blood-sucking insect, uh, like a mosquito, or in this case, a blood-sucking fly. Uh, that red arrow is pointing to uh, Dermatobia eggs. Um, the Dermatobia captured this blood-sucking fly, laid its eggs on it, but didn't kill it. So the blood-sucking fly flies around until it finds a um, nice tasty mammal, uh, in this case a human, uh, to feed on. And as the blood-sucking insect takes a blood meal, uh, the eggs hatch. Uh, the larvae drop right onto the host's skin, and they can't burrow uh, into the host's skin, but they can get in through the wound that the blood-sucking insect made. The end result, uh, sorry about this, I'll warn you in advance that some of these slides are going to be just a little bit on the disgusting side, and I may not always remember to uh, have you brace yourselves in advance. But parasitology can be a pretty squeaky uh, field. Uh, so that's the larva of a human bot fly uh, being removed from somebody's eye. Uh, they can also develop under the skin and have to be surgically removed from there. Uh, so this is a pretty straightforward human parasite, right? It lives at human's expense. It causes, you know, it causes damage to its host because, damn, you've got maggots growing in your eye, like, ow. Uh, but it's also got a phoretic relationship with those blood-sucking insects that transmit it. Um, it does not particularly harm those, it just hitches a ride on them. So there you've got a species that is both a phoretic commensal and a parasite of different hosts at different times in its life cycle, which is neat. Okay, so we talked about types of symbiotic relationships. Inquilinism and foracy usually aren't really types of parasitism. Uh, they'd be more commensal than parasitic, but we've seen some of the tricks that parasites can play. A few more words before we move on. Ectoparasites live on the outside and endoparasites live on the inside. Uh, so ectoparasites that you would know uh, would include fleas, uh, ticks, and lice. Uh, so there you've got a star tick, a, a lone star tick over there on the right, which if you spend any time walking around outside in Arkansas, you've probably seen before. And then endoparasites, that is a human intestinal roundworm uh, captured by endoscopic, uh, endoscopic camera uh, inside somebody's intestine. Um, so tapeworms, uh, flukes, Intestinal roundworms like this one, uh, parasitic protists uh, like the things that cause amoebic dysentery and hiker's diarrhea and things like that, those would all be endoparasites. Incidentally, we'll see a few examples later. Uh, there are some that actually live part in and part out, and we call those mesoparasites. Uh, the example I'm thinking of is a very weird crustacean. Uh, that partway burrows into its host, which happens to be a whale, uh, and then lets its egg, sac egg sacs protrude out of the host. We call that meso, if you're half in and half out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You have organisms that are facultative. Facultative anything 
means that the organism sometimes does it and sometimes does not. Uh, so a facultative aerobe uh, would be a critter that can survive with oxygen, but also can survive without it. And a facultative parasite uh, can survive as a free living organism, but can also parasitize a host if the opportunity presents itself. I did an undergraduate honors thesis uh, way back a, not that long, Please, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, sorry, I suddenly realized it was almost 30 years ago. Uh, but a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I did an undergrad honors thesis on an amoeba, uh, very much like this one, uh, called Neglaria gruberi. The one that you're looking at here is a close relative called Neglaria fowleri. Neglaria gruberi, fortunately for me, is harmless. Uh, knowing my lab technique at the time, I probably should not have worked on anything uh, pathogenic. A Neglaria fowleri can live at warmer temperatures, and Neglaria fowleri can live perfectly well just hanging out in uh, fairly warm water. Um, Again, it likes a higher temperature than, than Gruberi does. But if you happen to get this thing up your nose, uh, it will probably crawl into your brain uh, and start eating it and cause a particularly nasty brain infection called amoebic meningoencephalitis. Uh, that's usually fatal. Uh, we'll actually talk about this later because this was big news about five years ago uh, there was a um, girl named Callie Hardig uh, from Arkansas uh, who got this at a water park in South Little Rock, which, by the way, is now closed, um, and made national news when she was one of a very small number of people to get this and survive. Uh, Arkansas Children's treated her. They got emergency permission to get a drug imported from Germany that the FDA had not approved for use in this country, but they were able to bend the rules. And she had a little brain damage when she came back because a bunch of Tam amoebas had been eating her brain. Uh, but she's apparently made a full recovery. And I don't know where she's going to school, but she'd be a freshman about now. Um, anyways, uh, there might be some of you that might remember this case. This would... So that would be a facultative parasite. You can also have parasites that are accidental if they enter the wrong host species by chance. There are lots of parasites that can infect humans and cause symptoms, cause disease, but they're not capable of completing their life cycle. Uh, one that we'll talk about is a particular roundworm or a nematode uh, called anisakis uh, that you can get from eating uh, raw uh, ocean fish, uh, salmon in particular. Um, tends to be a problem in countries like Japan that have a cultural tradition of eating raw salmon. Um, and it's not usually fatal, I guess it could be, um, and the parasite can't complete its life cycle in humans, but it can make you very uncomfortable um, before it finally, it finally self-limits. That would be an accidental parasite. Uh, this is another one. Uh, that is the egg of a different roundworm called Bayless ascaris, and its natural host is raccoons. Now, raccoons crap a lot and they tend to have these kind of communal latrines. If you have a colony of raccoons, uh, they'll all tend to go poop in the same place. Uh, I have heard of homeowners getting an, an extremely nasty surprise when they open the attic and realize that a colony of raccoons has taken up residence. Uh, there may be quite an accumulation of raccoon poop uh, in the attic. A uh, good reason to put screen over uh, all of your entrances. Right. Um, humans have been known to pick up eggs from raccoon feces. 
Uh, sometimes in the process of trying to clean up a mess made by a bunch of raccoons. Uh, sometimes it's little kids that are not careful about washing their hands or picking up random objects that they find. Um, and humans that can pick this up uh, can potentially die, uh, certainly can become very ill. Uh, because if eggs of Bayless ascaris enter the human body, uh, usually by touching feces and then putting your fingers in your mouth, um, they will hatch. Instead of hanging out in the gut uh, the way they're supposed to do in the raccoon, the larvae get confused and they start wandering through your tissues. Uh, this is a common enough condition that it's got its own name and we'll be seeing this again down the road. Uh, this is called larval migrans. Uh, when you have parasite larvae that are crawling through your tissues, uh, you can get cutaneous larval migrans where larvae of a parasite crawl under your skin. Uh, sometimes they leave little red wiggly tracks and things. Um, you can also get visceral larval migrans where the larvae will just start crawling through internal organs uh, and Bayless ascaris will do this and it's got a nasty habit of crawling right through your brain which you do not want to have happen you don't want you know worms in your brain it's not very good for your odds of getting into grad school so moral of the story never let it be said i don't teach useful information uh, the moral of the story is please be careful about handling raccoon poop. Uh, if you ever do have to clean out a nest of raccoons from your attic, you're going to want hazmat clothing. You're going to want masks. Uh, I assume you will have a copious supply of masks for years on end uh, after the pandemic is over. Uh, but seriously, this is something you might want to get trained people to do, and you're probably going to wear to wear hazmats and disposable gloves and things like that if you ever have to deal with raccoon poop. Bayless ascaris can be deadly. And that's an accidental parasite. And then finally, I think it was Jonathan Swift uh, who wrote a little poem that went, so naturalists observe a flea have smaller fleas upon him prey, and these have smaller fleas to bite him, and so proceeds ad infinitum. Right? A flea has little fleas, and those fleas have litter, littler fleas, and it keeps on going. Well, it doesn't keep on going indefinitely, but you can have hyperparasites where you have a parasite on a parasite, and this is one of them. Uh, this is a, uh, a copepod. It's a type of uh, crustacean. Uh, there are lots of freshwater copepods that you might have seen if you've taken a course in freshwater biology. Uh, there's also lots of marine copepods, very important in the food web. And there's a fair number of parasitic copepods. And this is one of them. This copepod is a parasite on starry flounder, uh, platycthes. And then right there, these little things that are kind of hanging off it are parasitic worms, uh, parasitic uh, flatworms uh, called Udinella caligorum. So you've got a parasite of a parasite here. Uh, this has been removed, so you can't see the host, but this thing would be hanging out on uh, flounder, I assume you've seen flounders before, right? Really flat and very delicious fish. Right. Uh, in terrestrial ecosystems, I'm told you can have as many as seven levels of hyperparasitism. Uh, oftentimes, those levels might be fungi and uh, bacteria in addition to, uh, uh, to animals and protists. So if memory serves, there's one case where you have a plant, you'll have an insect that sucks the plant sap, and then you'll have a fungus that's parasitic on the insect, and then a fungus that's parasitic on the fungus that's parasitic on the insect. 
and this starts to sound like the hole in the bottom of the sea, right? You know the song? Okay. Um, and I think the record is seven levels of hyperparasitism. For some reason, um, I couldn't really tell you why. If, I don't really know if there is an interesting reason for it, but there's much more hyperparasitism in land ecosystems than there is in marine ecosystems. It may just be because there's lots more land fungi than marine fungi, and fungi seem to be really good at this sort of thing, but I don't actually know. Okay, right. Woo, woof -da. Um, three minutes. If you have a parasite that spends its entire life on a single, in a single host species, it's said to be monozenus. X-E-N-O, xenos, is Greek for foreigner or stranger, right? If you're xenophobic, that means you're afraid of strangers. If you're xenophilic, that means you're, you like strangers. If you're monozenous, that means, I, I get, means stranger, it could also mean guest. So monozenous would be a guest of only one. Um, this thing that looks like a bunch of lemons is a protist. We might see this in lab. Um, I usually don't, but this makes a really good demonstration of parasites uh, because you can find these in every flippant earthworm that there is. I've never tested an earthworm that didn't have these. Uh, you can remove an earthworm's seminal vesicles, swash them on a microscope slide, and in every one I've ever tried, you see lots of these. Uh, this is a protist. It's a parasite. It eats uh, earthworm sperm. It's a worm sperm germ. Thank you. And except for a very brief time when these little lemon-shaped things leave the host and hang out to the soil and wait for another earthworm to swallow them, uh, it lives all of its life in, uh, in an earthworm, one host. Uh, there's even a few parasites that parasitize not just one host, but one individual. Uh, this is a roundworm called Strongyloides stercoralis. It lives in your intestine. It lives in your large intestine. And it's not native to North America, it's native to the tropics, in particular the tropical Pacific. And they found a few years ago some World War II veterans who had fought in the Pacific, and they picked this up. 60 years later, they were still infected, not by the same worms, uh, by the distant descendants of the worms that they picked up in the tropical Pacific. Uh, this particular worm, usually parasites have to spread their eggs out to a new host, but this particular one, the eggs can hatch within the body of the same host, and generation after generation after generation of worms can keep infecting the same individual. Um, mild infections don't have very strong symptoms, so I don't think these men knew that anything was, was, was wrong but they had been hosting generations of Strongyloides stercoralis worms uh, ever since coming back uh, from Tarawa or the Philippines or Guadalcanal or wherever it might have been. Last thing, parasites that spend different life cycle stages in different host species are called heterozenous. There'll be a definitive host, which is where the parasite does sexual reproduction and an intermediate host, often where the parasite will undergo asexual reproduction. We'll get more detail on this later, but the classic example here is liver flukes. The definitive host of Fasciola hepatica is a cow. Uh, the adults live in the cow's liver and bile duct and eat the cow's liver and mucus and blood lay lots of eggs and the eggs all pass out in the cow patties. Um, once the cow has defecated, the eggs hatch into little larvae that penetrate into snakes. 
and they go through several rounds of reproduction inside the snails. Exactly how many depends on what species we're talking about. And we'll get those details later, how they go from Miracidia to Sporocysts to Redia to Cercaria, and then finally to a stage called Metis called Cercaria, which burrows out of the snail, climbs up on the grass, and forms a resting stage that gets eaten by the cow. So in that case, the cow is the definitive host because the cow is where the parasite reproduces sexually, and the snail is the intermediate host, and this would be an example of a heterozenous parasite species. <sighs> okay, right, I think that went a whole lot better. Any questions from the uh, folks in class? Okay, I have evidently explained that with such incredible grace and skill that uh, nobody has any questions. That's amazing. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now.